Welcome. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family, and we are delighted that you have welcomed us into your home, and we wish you a blessed Amen. Lent on this beautiful Ash Wednesday day. We certainly would love to hear from you, so please send us an email with a question or a comment to Jim and Joy at EWTN.com. Well, today we have a very special guest with us. His name is Dr. George Delgado, and he is the president of the Steno Institute. He is also the founder of the Abortion Pill Rescue Network. Please go to his website, stenoinstitute.org. Mm. And we are going to have a very informative conversation because there's so many of us in the church and out of the church that we just don't understand this abortion issue or we have our heads stuck in the sand and we refuse to believe it. And so today we're going to lift the veil. And so we're going to help you to see and to know the great work and how God is using Dr. Delgado to expose a great evil in our land. So <clears throat> as we are entering into the season today with Ash Wednesday, a most important part, I would think, of Ash Wednesday uh, and devotion to the Lord is human life and the sanctity and dignity of the human person. And Dr. Delgado is, on the, is a pioneer and on the cutting edge of that whole work of working with women who are pregnant through about 10 weeks and they take this abortion pill mm -hmm. um, and he's worked on a protocol to reverse that and is working to save lives, to save these women, uh, give them a second chance yes. at, at, at letting the life that they've conceived you know, live. 40daysforlife.com is also a, a great resource. Uh, their campaign starts today. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's all about saving lives. I want to share a verse that I thought of when we thought of Dr. Delgado and having him. Thinking about fasting, Isaiah 58, 5 through 7. Is this the fast I've chosen a day for a man to deny himself, to bow his head like a reed and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Isn't this the fast that I've chosen? to break the chains of wickedness, to unite the cords of the yoke, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to tear off every yoke. Isn't it to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the poor and homeless into your home, to clothe the naked when you see them and do not turn away from your own flesh and blood? We think about the preborn. Mm. And we, we think about the poor and the needy. Let's not turn away from them. We think about war, the Ukraine, you know, that, that, how pleasing it is to the Lord when we reach out and we affirm the sanctity and dignity of the human person, maybe save a life, save a soul by the grace of God. Think about all of this for the season of Lent. Dr. Delgado is here. He's going to speak to us about his pioneering work and the rescue of lives uh, that otherwise would have been uh, met their demise. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back. Plenty more to come. Please don't go away. Welcome back. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and today we're very excited to bring to you our guest, Dr. George Delgado. He is the president of the Steno Institute, and he is also the founder of the Abortion Pill Rescue Network. And please go to his website, Steno Institute's website, just stenoinstitute.org, where you could learn about this conversation and is this really happening? and um, so that you would be empowered with the truth so that if you have a friend or a family member, you might want to share this beautiful conversation with them. Well, Dr. Delgado, we are excited to have you. We have been fans from afar. Mm -hmm. um, I shared a stage with you in San Francisco when you talking about the abortion pill reversal many years ago. Um, and uh, you had a client who gave her testimony yeah, and presented her fantastic. beautiful son. Right. That was beautiful. And, um, and then last year, you did a great work for uh, Heartbeat International, which 
we're affiliated with as a pregnancy medical center here in Birmingham. So thank you for your pioneer work. Um, we know that it's, uh, they're all not just applauding you and being so grateful. And so we pray for you and we thank you for your courage and for your fortitude and for your brilliance in this area. Well, we want you first to tell our family a little bit about you and, um, and then we'll get into the beautiful ministry that God's doing with you. Well, God gave me a beautiful Catholic family of origin. My parents had seven boys and um, raised us in the Catholic faith, which was the greatest gift that they could have given us. My, uh, one of my older brothers is a priest in the Stockton Diocese in California. And I have uh, I've been married uh, to my lovely wife, Elizabeth, who works side by side with me in the pro-life mm -hmm. movement and who, who is a great, great blessing. I always say that I know that God loves me more than he loves her because <laughs> he gave her to me. <laughs> and we have uh, four wonderful children, three are married, six, uh, number uh, six grandchild is mm -hmm. on the way. Mm -hmm. So we've been uh, very, very blessed to have mm -hmm. uh, so many great gifts in our lives. Thank you. Well, Doc, we want to share about um, the science of the abortion pill reversal. And I guess we do want to say as well, perhaps there's many people in our family or viewing audience today that may have used RU486 and have lost the child. Um, so we're not here to condemn people. We pray God's mercy upon them. We will have up uh, links and websites where you can get post-abortion healing. Uh, you can visit with your, your priest if you've never confessed this and, and receive healing. So we're just here to, to, to share about the reality of what, what's going on. So many people weren't even aware of what they were doing in various circumstances and situations. Um, but let's, let's begin. How did you get to this point uh, in your own medical career, I'm sure you doing many things besides abortion pill reversal. What led you into this area? When did that take place for you? Well, I really think it was the Holy Spirit who led me. Uh, like I look at my career, how it progressed. It really, God had a hand in it. And fortunately, there were key times when I let him work and, and got out of his way. The first part was that um, I had a strong conversion in my life and, and I was always Catholic and went to Mass every Sunday, but I was what you might call a cafeteria Catholic. Yeah. But I firmly committed my life to Christ, and, and my wife did too, and, and we put our family on a really great path from then on, which bore so many wonderful fruit. Part yes. of that was learning how to use natural procreative technology mm -hmm. or NAPRO technology developed by Tom, Dr. Thomas Hilgers in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. And learning that, I learned how to use progesterone with women who had situations called threatened miscarriages. That's where it looked like they might miscarry. If their progesterone levels are low, I could give them progesterone and sometimes save the baby. So I knew how to do that. Also, far before mifepristone, which was then known as RU-46, was approved, I had been studying it and I knew exactly how it worked, that it works by blocking progesterone receptors. And I knew that, and finally when it came on the market, then I was very well versed in that. Fast forward several years to about uh, 2009, when I got a call in my office while I was seeing patients from a sidewalk counselor called uh, Terry Palmquist, who was in Bakersfield, California. I was in San Diego. She had a woman on the line who was in El Paso, Texas, who had taken mifepristone, RU-46, and had changed her mind and had asked Terry, is there anything I can do to stop my abortion? So Terry had no idea, so she called me. And I said, Terry, well, I've never heard of this before. But let me stop and think about it. And that's where the Holy Spirit put one and one together in my mind. My knowledge of progesterone, my knowledge of how mifepristone worked. And I said, well, I have an idea. Since I know that mifepristone blocks the effects of progesterone, which is essential for pregnancy, that's why it's called progesterone, progestation. Okay. It's really an acronym name. I thought maybe if we give extra progesterone, we can outcompete the mifepristone at the receptor site and the progesterone can win the battle while the mifepristone washes out mm -hmm. of the system. Mm -hmm. I had one problem though. I was in San Diego, the woman was in El Paso, Texas. But I got on the phone and I found a doctor in El Paso who was also NAPRO trained, who had progesterone in the office. And at that time we were using a lot of injected progesterone. Mm -hmm. okay. So I came up with a protocol on the fly. I suggested it to her. She agreed to do it and she treated that woman. And several weeks later she gave me a phone call and said, you know, the baby survived. I think we saved the baby by giving mm -hmm. progesterone to offset the effects of the mifepristone of the RU486. Mm -hmm. Incredible. And it's, it's stories like this that I think really brings home to the general population 
about life and death, that this is not just an issue that we debate pro-choice, pro-life. It's about a human person, that baby, and it's about the mother in regret, and that this baby would not be here without this process, without this treatment. Mm -hmm. And I think that opens people's eyes. I know it, it does for me, because he's saying like, this is really real, this is really happening. This makes the difference between, between life and death. Share with us who the target of chemical or medical abortion is. What's the demographic? What's the description of that child? Because some people might be thinking this is three 24 weeks or full term. Who, who is this? You, know, I, you should say patient, it's not a patient. This is an execution of, of a child. So, so what, what is the demographic of that baby that's yeah, liable the, to the go The other way to put it, I said, okay. who's victimized yeah. by what's, what I call the medical abortion complex? Who are they after? So with the medical okay. abortion, sometimes called chemical abortion, it's approved up to 10 weeks of pregnancy. Okay. And so that's 70 days after the first day of the last menstrual period. But we have seen that the envelope is being pushed and that it's sometimes being given at 11 weeks, sometimes at 12 weeks. And of course, with the deregulation of the abortion industry, with women now getting the abortion pill online with telemedicine visits or just ordering it, we're going to see women taking it f further along in pregnancy and they may be running into complications. As far as who else is really targeted, it's really the same group that's targeted by surgical abortion, and that is minorities. Hispanic women, black women, we know that black women make up 13% of the population that are blacks, but 39% of all abortions are committed on mm. blacks. So they're being targeted in, in the low income areas and in their low socioeconomic areas. The two of you know that in the pregnancy yeah. center where you work, that unfortunately they're targeted. Well, so when um, for RU46 first came out, it used to be a, a higher milligram in the beginning, right? And then somewhere along the line, they decreased the milligram. And, um, but wasn't it making it less effective? Or was it, was it, you still seeing the same results just from the mifepristone and misoprostol uh, combination? Yeah, the results are pretty close. Right now, the standard dose in the U.S. is 200 mm -hmm. milligrams. But you're right, the initial studies were using 600 mm -hmm. milligrams. And in fact, in some countries in Europe, like in Switzerland, they still use 600 milligrams. The reason why they cut down the dose was really an economic one because the uh, 600 milligram costs three times as much as the 200 milligrams, yeah. so they want to use less money. As far as the effectiveness in abortion, it's a little less with the 200 than with the 600, but not that big of a difference. Mm -hmm. What are the markers for this embryo or preborn child up to 10 weeks? What's happening with that child? What's the developmental markers for this child? Well, an embryo that's uh, two, 10 weeks old is uh, definitely going to have a heartbeat because we can detect a heartbeat yeah. at uh, about five and a half to six weeks uh, on ultrasound. It's definitely going to be able to feel pain because we think that the baby can feel pain by about seven weeks. It's going to have fingers. It's going to have toes. It's going to have eyes. Everything is going to be very, very, very well formed because really at 10 weeks now, um, from an embryologic standpoint, we start calling the preborn baby now a fetus yes. because all of the major organs are formed. So um, when a woman passes that 10-week baby in her bathroom mm -hmm. for Lauren, she is going to see a very identifiable preborn baby that is going to look much more like you and me than like a clump of cells. Right. Yeah. And that's one of the greatest lies out there, family. We want you to know this, is that um, they tell women that it isn't a baby, that it is just a clump of cells, it's just a, a mass, it's not anything, the baby doesn't have a heartbeat. <coughs> And then when they see and let, they go through with the RU46 and they are at home and this little sack comes out with this little human being on the inside. I had one client who said to me, um, well, what I did was, I said, well, what did you do? Then did you flush it down the toilet? And she said to me, no, I couldn't because it was a human being. And she said, so I had to bury it. And so she buried it in her yard because she had to, and she was praying. She didn't even tell her husband that she had taken the RU-46. So there's this awareness that when we see with our eyes, right, what we're really is happening, that there's an awakening, there's an epiphany inside of us, mm -hmm. and it's, oh, my God, what have I done? But then it's too late. 
And so that's where pregnancy resource centers, support after abortion, post-abortion healing ministries come to a big part in abortion pill reversal because now we have to not you we're doing what you're doing medically but now we have to take care of the other part of the person the emotional the spiritual the psychological effects of that is to say now how can we help you heal and mend so it is a great partnership right Absolutely, and the counseling that your centers provide is really essential because these women have a lot of indecision, need a lot of support. Sometimes their partners, their husbands, their boyfriends, their parents are mm -hmm. forcing them to have abortions or strongly encouraging them. So they need the voice of reason, someone to say, no, there is another way, and to give them that support to hold their hands, to accompany them on that journey. Mm -hmm. Doc, go through with us again. In order for a successful pregnancy, there has to be a good progesterone level and so you learned early on that this is a key reason why a lot of women are losing their children you got to mm -hmm. up the progesterone tell us again what the mifeprestone right what's that doing to the progesterone and what progesterone does does it give give blood to the woman nutrients to the baby and then what's mifepristone how's it attacking that the very thing that should be natural and working you know well it, it's under attack how does it attack it yeah, so progesterone is an absolutely wonderful hormone. It's a great design that God has given us. Progesterone actually starts to work before pregnancy during the second part of the phase called the luteal phase by thickening the lining of the uterus so that the uterus is receptive to the seven-day embryonic person mm -hmm. that comes down to implant. Okay. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that part of the placenta, a very thin part called the decidual basalis, the mother's part of the placenta, is under the effect of progesterone. So that develops in a healthy manner because of progesterone. And if that's not there, the rest of the placenta from the baby won't stick tight. And by sticking tight, that's how the baby gets mm -hmm. nutrients from the mother. The next thing that progesterone does is it causes the muscle of the uterus to stay nice and relaxed. And you know that you can't have the uterus squeezing while the baby's trying to grow. Mm -hmm. The uterus needs to be relaxed so that it can stretch out. The other thing that progesterone does is it keeps the cervix closed. I call it a biologic valve. It keeps the outside world separate from the inside world. Mm -hmm. The inside world's a sanctuary. You don't want the outside world interacting. And finally, it prepares the breasts to make milk, but it inhibits them from, from making milk. So the breasts are right at the starting line, mm -hmm. ready to go, but won't start making milk till after the delivery. So it's a very elegant design. So how does the mifepristone, the RU46 work? Think about a key going into a lock and turning the lock and a door opening. That's what I call the hormone effect. The progesterone is the key that opens the lock and opens the door. Now you've probably had that experience where you've had a key that fit into the lock but didn't turn it. Right. So we call that a false key. That's what the mifepristone does. Mm -hmm. It's a false key, it occupies the receptor but doesn't allow the door to open so you don't get the good effect of the progesterone. And what happens if you don't have the good effect of the progesterone, it's blocked then the placenta separates. That's the prime effect of the mifepristone. When it separates, then the baby no longer gets nutrients mm -hmm. and hydration, the baby dies. Mm -hmm. And so technically, it starves the child, right? Exactly. And so, and we have to understand that language that we're gonna take a pill, that what this pill is going to do is cut this baby off from the blood supply and starve it. And then this baby is gonna die inside of me. And so when you say this beautiful, elegant design, you know, and here we are taking this chemical that's going to disrupt this beautiful, almighty God designed for life. And we know yeah. the importance of progesterone in our lives because we have grandchildren who are sitting around our table because when our daughters got pregnant, they had miscarriages in their past because of low progesterone. And so as soon as they got pregnant, they knew they needed to get right. progesterone incorporated into their body. And we have grandchildren because of it. And so the importance of that progesterone and getting that to that woman who maybe has taken that first pill and then has the regret like, can this, can this be reversed? <clears throat> Is there a way for me to stop this process? And thank God, being Holy Spirit led, as you so humbly said, um, you said, yes, there is a way to stop this. Tell us, we got just a minute or two, a minute really before our break, but introduce us to the, there's another pill in the RE486 process. 
What's the second pill? What does it do? So yes, there is another pill. The first pill, the mifepristone RU46, kills the baby, like you said, by starving the baby. Well, what they found out in the early studies was that some percentage of the time, 20, maybe to up to 40 percent of the time, the uterus did not completely empty the context of the remains of the dead baby. And so they added a second drug to be taken usually 24 to 48 hours later called misoprostol, also known as Cytotec. And what that does is it causes very strong uterine contractions, okay. which squeezes all the contents of the uterus out, including the remains of the preborn baby mm -hmm. that was killed by the mifepristone. Mm -hmm. Well, it's hard to say thank you, but thank you for the truth, you mm -hmm. know, of how this is, is working. We want to unpack this more fully in the next segment, so we're going to hold you over. Plenty more to come. We'll be right back. You can always go to stenoinstitute.org, stenoinstitute.org. Dot org for more information. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, we're having a great show with Dr. George Delgado. And Jim, I know you yeah. wanted to ask him the final yeah. question before this yeah. segment ends. Again, we work in a pregnancy medical center, and it's amazing when we get our phone calls and everybody, you know, because we're Heart Choice Birmingham Women's Center, they think we're an abortion center. So it's kind of like, you know, I want the pill. You know, and I think the idea is just that you take a pill and then your baby is aborted and all this is pretty clinical and just gets done. But it's much more complicated than that, and the chemicals that they're using and what it does to a woman's body. And so share with us the dangers of RU486, which are ever increasing because so much of this is not even done with a local direct doctor that somebody could go back to if they got problems. It's being done more and more technologically. So what, what can happen in this process? What are the dangers with it? Well, the medical abortion complex promised that it would be safer than surgical abortion and there would be more privacy and preferred than surgical abortion. In many ways, lies on all fronts. There's a very good study out of Finland in 2009. In Finland, as you know, they have a very centralized medical system. They know what prescription everybody gets, who goes to the emergency department. Everything is tracked. They found that medical abortions had four times the risk of surgical abortions there. And it was primarily a much higher risk of bleeding compared to surgical abortions. And of course, a much higher risk of needing a second procedure because oftentimes it failed. So that's the first thing that women and everybody needs to know that it's not safer than surgical abortion. Number two, with this new deregulation of the abortion industry in our country, many more women are going to be getting mifepristone. They already are online either through telehealth where they actually have some sort of medical encounter with a healthcare professional, or just by ordering online, either legally or illegally. And so what's gonna happen there is that women won't, will not be getting ultrasounds before they have the abortion. And we know that one to 2% of all pregnancies in the United States are ectopic pregnancies. Ectopic pregnancies, as you know, are very dangerous. The tube can rupture and a woman could die if she doesn't get medical treatment in a timely fashion. So she takes the, the abortion pill, starts to bleed, she thinks it's just from the abortion pill, but let's say she's actually ble bleeding because she's ruptured her mm. tube. She doesn't go to the hospital, she dies right there in her own bathroom. Mm. The other thing is that 15% of all women are RH negative, and women need to know that when they're pregnant because when the abortion occurs, there's mixing of the blood. The preborn baby's blood mixes with the mother's blood, if the preborn baby is RH positive, the mother is RH negative, she will then get sensitized. And so they're supposed to give a shot at the abortion center, but if they're not checking the RH, she'll never get that shot. And what that does is it leads her to doomed pregnancies mm -hmm. in the future, wanted pregnancies that likely will end in stillbirth because she was not treated for being RH negative. The social risks are huge. These online um, medical abortions and are going to lead to drug, uh, to human trafficking, rapists and molesters getting these drugs and then giving them forcibly to women they've impregnated. Mm. So you can see that the 
The deregulation is going to be a disaster, and it's being fueled by the availability of mifepristone RU-486. Mm. Well, we thank God that we have another day with mm -hmm. you, and we hope that we could share more good news, but you're sharing the truth. And if we know the truth, as Jesus said, the truth will set you free. And that's a work that you're doing by telling the truth, no matter what this culture says or other mm -hmm. people that are in it for whatever reason. Or we know it's just, it's, it ends a life, and it's absolutely devastating for the women that participate in it. So thank you. Thank you for joining us today. All together, we will build a new culture of life, marriage, and the family. God bless you this Ash Wednesday and throughout the whole season of Lent. And put on your Lenten plate, lifting up the sanctity and dignity of every human being and doing some almsgiving in that area to give for this great cause of life. Bye now.